I'm Neha Shah. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank Nora for inviting me here today to speak with you. Um, our objectives are plain and simple. I have 45 minutes to give you a very brief and somewhat superficial introduction of integrative rheumatology because it really is a very broad topic and something I'm very passionate about. So um, I will do my best in the limited time that we have. Um, and I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest to, um, to disclose. So um, a little bit about myself. I grew up right up here up the road in Cupertino, Monta Vista Matador. And I, um, I grew up in a traditional Indian household. And growing up, whenever I was sick or my siblings were sick, my mother, the first thing she would reach for was not the telephone to call the pediatrician. It was the little stainless steel spice um, container in the kitchen cabinet. And um, there was a lot of turmeric and ginger and garlic oil and all kinds of home remedies that went around, particularly in the winter months. So then I went to medical school at University of Florida, went to, did my residency in internal medicine at University of Flor uh, Miami, and then ended up back here at Stanford for my fellowship in rheumatology and went on to practice conventional rheumatology. And I always felt like there was something missing. Um, there was... Uh, you know, I had pills and things to give to my patients, but I had this secret, you know, in my closet. I had the secret that there's all kinds of other things out there that work and that can help and that can be used with the medications. So I just didn't feel qualified to share that with my patients. So I went on to do a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona under Dr. Andrew Weil and Tarona Lodog and several really amazing mentors um, and it really broadened my horizons and opened up a whole new world to me. So my whole practice of rheumatology transformed after that two-year um, integrative medicine fellowship. So what exactly is integrative medicine? It is combining the best of all worlds um, and really having this um, shared relationship with my patients where we really work as a team and look at all options to try to achieve you know, their greatest health um, as best as we can. Um, but we use this, we do this in a way using evidence um, and making use of all appropriate therapies. But um, for me, um, I, this, this fellowship really opened my mind and I, I hope it also helps me ha let my patients open their minds, but not so open that our brains fall out. So I'll be the first to say I love a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial to prove that something works. But um, for me, 3,000 years of experience and observation and tried and true remedies is also a different kind of evidence. Um, and this stems from, I guess, the, the first precision medicine that was out there before we had all kinds of amazing DNA technology, namely Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, some of these ancient uh, art forms, a as uh, you would be, that are very scientific in their own right. Um, and they can really provide patients with, with a whole system um, uh, form of medicine that, that really approaches all aspects of health. So. Um, Integrative medicine, um, how does that tie into rheumatology? Well, this is a little bit outdated. This study's from 2007, and it shows how um, complementary and alternative, alternative medicine practices have been used amongst adults in the United States. And if you can see here, back pain, neck pain, joint pain, arthritis, other musculoskeletal complaints, and I might argue that everything else that's listed there in some form or another also falls into the realm of rheumatology. So it seems like I picked a pretty good specialty for um, being able to integrate uh, these complementary and al alternative, I don't like to use the word alternative, holistic practices. Um, so really in integrative medicine and, and what my approach is towards patient is this idea that we're not just treating one disease or one symptom, we're really looking at patients as a whole. And that includes kind of like three aspects of the care, their body, their mind, and their spirit. I kind of think of it as um, three, three legs on a stool. And if any one of those legs is off balance or shorter than the other or whatever, that stool is just not going to be very balanced. And so we really need to look at the, the whole person. Um, and, and starting with body, 
I think one of the main areas to look for, there's, there's so many, and we're only going to touch on a, a few of them, but um, I think a lot of our health starts at the gut. And if you ask a gastroenterologist, they'll say, this is the brain. It's not up here. It's, it's here. And um, so, you know, 30, 40 plus years ago, probably before I was even born, naturopaths, chiropractors, the granola 1960s, 70s, you know, um, crunchy, earth-loving um, Americans, they had this idea about leaky gut, this idea that the intestinal barrier allowed in environmental um, allergens and triggers that prompted inflammation in the body. And conventional wisdom at the time, and I use the word wisdom lightly, was that that was a bunch of hogwash. Um, so they just said, okay, no, no, that can't be, the gut's tight, this is, this is ridiculous. Fast forward, and now conventional medicine had this novel idea of, this, of intestinal permeability. It's the same thing as leaky gut. Um, we've come a long ways, and now conventional medicine recognizes the fact that, like the skin, like the lungs, the GI tract is um, a huge portal through which the environment can affect our health. And so much of that um, is through medications that travel through the GI tract. Um, stress and how that affects nerves, how that affects the GI tract. Toxins, food particles, food allergens. Um, and and when, I, when I use the word allergens, I don't necessarily mean foods that cause hives and you know, tongue swelling. They can be foods that trigger other forms of inflammation, not just your you know, um, allergic type, anaphylactic type uh, of, of um, um, reactions. And then a big part of that, and this is now a huge, huge area of intense research, is the idea of, the, of bacteria. We have, and I might get this number wrong, I want to say about 10 trillion bacteria that live in our gut. And that is way more than the number of cells that we actually have in the human body, human cells. So um, our microbiome is a huge part of us. We live symbiotically with this microbiome. Um, that's, that's the word we use to describe this whole body of bacteria that lives in our intestines and our skin and our respiratory tract. Um, and in the ideal world, we are living symbiotically with this microbiome. But we live in an, idea, an, an, an ideal world, um, and that is that the microbiome isn't necessarily what it's supposed to be in a lot of patients. So um, what happens is all kinds of things. Um, lack of physical activity or too much of it. Um, surgical uh, interventions. We used to think an appendectomy was a pretty benign thing. Um, a lot of women undergoing uh, elective procedures like hysterectomies years ago when the surgeons went there, they would just nip the, the appendix out of there too because they figured, eh, we're in there. We'll just prevent appendicitis in the future. Um, so that's now been linked to an increased risk of dysbiosis, abnormal microbiome, an increased risk of, of certain autoimmune diseases, smoking, um, stress, vitamin, lack of vitamin D, rather, um, how clean we are, how much we wash our hands, how much time we spend outside in the dirt, um, what we eat, how much we sleep, all of this has a huge impact on this whole world of, of, of life that's living inside of our intestines. Um, and really, we are just now touching on the tip of the iceberg of, of how that microbiome is affecting our health. So when I use the word dysbiosis, I want to clarify that um, certain types of dysbiosis are very obvious. If somebody's walking around with amoeba or parasites that are in their gut that we know are not supposed to be there, it's, it's kind of an easy thing. Tapeworms, we can recognize that. But there's also this idea that there is an ideal wild type of uh, microbiome uh, patterns, meaning certain, uh, a high number of certain types and certain families of bacteria, lower numbers of other ones that should be all living in balance. And when that is off balance, it starts affecting our health. We have yet to, I think, fully grasp exactly what is the perfect balance, um, but we are starting to recognize what patterns are, are maybe negative patterns that, that um, affect health in a negative way. So 
when we feel that a patient has um, dysbiosis going on, and, and uh, some of you may be familiar, there are many companies out there that offer stool testing um, to see, you know, what does your, your microbiotic family look like. And um, uh, there are, some companies have put out uh, patterns that they think are associated with good health and other patterns that are associated with negative health. I'm not sure that a lot of these tests have been completely validated yet, but I think that science is, is approaching a place where we'll have a better understanding of what's a good microbiome and, and what isn't necessarily a good microbiome. But um, what I tend to do with my patients is this um, weed, seed, and feed type of approach to dysbiosis. And I kind of go with the, the presumption or with the, the assumption when a patient comes to me with some kind of autoimmune disease that they likely have some kind of dysbiosis going on, even if I haven't um, done a stool study to look at what's, what's growing in their gut. Um, and, and like I said, so many things affect that. The biggest things in this day and age, um, C-sections, right? We saw this huge rise in C-sections. So from, the, from day one, from birth, you had babies being born that were not being exposed to the microbiome of their mother because they didn't pass through the vaginal canal. You have antibiotics that um, are being, you know, doled out like candy, a little better nowadays, but, you know, back 20, 30 years ago. Um, and still in a lot of countries, um, antibiotics just being, you know, you don't need a prescription to get them. So there are a lot of resistant bacteria. So the first part is this weeding idea is we should try to get rid of things that really shouldn't be there, or at least lower populations of bacteria that shouldn't be there. And then the second part is the seeding part, um, probiotics, fermented foods. And the last part is the feeding, is our bugs need to eat. Our little pet bugs that are in us, our friends, they need to eat. So foods um, that support the growth of friendly gut bacteria. Um, so these are things that uh, when I see a patient, maybe not on the first visit, maybe the first visit we're focused on trying to figure out what they have because a lot of rheumatology can be a little bit of a puzzle. Um, but uh, as we get deeper into our relationship, um, we start talking about diet and lifestyle and, and other things. Have they had a lot of antibiotics um, over the course of the last few years? What was their birth history? Um, when they were growing up, did they have a lot of infections? So we look into all these things to figure out you know, uh, in, you know, intuitively, what does their gut flora probably look like right now? So um, I'm not going to go into detail about a lot of these. I'm just kind of listing, lifting, uh, listing them. But um, in general, we need to love our guts. We need to take care of our guts, and and that can be done a lot of ways. And the way I'm going to focus on right now is through um, the diet. If any of you are more interested in learning about the microbiome, uh, we have a husband-wife team of really brilliant microbiologists here at Stanford, um, Justin and Erica Sonnenberg, and they've written this great book called The Good Gut. Um, and it really is, uh, is an amazing um, uh, insight into the research they've done as well as a lot of other research that's been done in the area of the microbiome. Um, and uh, this was actually a picture of them that was taken, I think it might have been the New York Times, New York Magazine. Um, it was set up. They don't usually have dirt on their, on their dinner table. Um, so the next step forward into the, from this microbiome idea is our diet because it has such a huge impact on what's growing in our gut. Um, in addition to direct effects, macro and micronutrient effects on our inflammation in our immune systems in our body, that's um, separate uh, from its effect on our gut um, microflora. And specifically for rheumatoid arthritis, there's actually um, a somewhat limited but but impressive in terms of, of uh, results, a body of evidence for diet having an impact on rheumatoid arthritis and inflammation. And you know, going back hundreds of years ago, um, food was medicine, right? There, there weren't pharmaceutical companies and pills. People used food as medicine. And then conventional Western medicine sort of got away from that. But kind of in the 80s and the 90s, there was this resurging um, interest in looking at diet and inflammation and diet specifically in rheumatoid arthritis. Most of the studies um, in the 80s and 90s that came out that supported a role of dietary change and its impact on inflammation and RA came out of uh, Scandinavia, mostly Sweden. Um, you know, they have a socialized medicine. 
You can take a bunch of patients and throw them into a health spa and force them to eat a certain diet. It's a little harder to do that in America. So most of those studies come out of, of Sweden. And um, some of the studies supported um, uh, a gluten-free diet for uh, improvement in inflammation. Many studies that were done out of Sweden uh, supported vegan and or vegetarian diets. Um, so there, like I said, is limited data, but it is very impressive what is there. Um, our standard American diet, the SAD diet, um, and Western diets in general do confer a greater risk for developing rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and, and I'm saying rheumatoid arthritis because that is where a lot of the studies have been done, but I think just in general that can be somewhat extrapolated to autoimmune diseases in general. Um, there was another study that was looking at fish consumption, oily cold water fish that are high in omega-3 omega consumption and the potential risk for developing rheumatoid arthritis. And they found that the patients who were in the highest quartile of develop of uh, sorry omega-3 fish consumption had the lowest risk of developing RA, whereas those who were in the lowest quartile of fish consumption had the highest risk of developing RA. So in general, um, I propose to my patients that they try to shift their diets to more of a Mediterranean, low-fat, um, plant-based diet um, with some addition of omega-3 heavy fish. Um, and I also do a lot of elimination diets with my patients. There are many, many diets that are out there um, that propose some sort of elimination, gluten-free, dairy-free, um, soy-free, corn-free, uh, meat-free, sugar-free. Um, sugar is a huge promoter of inflammation. Um, and I think even though from the standpoint of um, the kind of research Stanford likes to see that that double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial, there's not a lot out there uh, for, for specific food um, an, uh, antigens and rheumatoid arthritis or other types of inflammation. I think this is a really low-risk intervention that we can do with our patients. Um, it, it's, there's not a lot of harm in taking certain things out of the diet for three to four weeks and then reintroducing them to see, do patients have more pain? Do they get a flare of any skin rash? Do they get headaches? Do they get sinus congestion? Um, what happens when we re reintroduce cer certain things? Um, and in my clinical experience, I've had patients um, decide they don't want to go back. You know, They'll do their three to four weeks of an elimination, and they feel so much better if they've cut out certain things that they, they, they just don't want to go back. For other patients, um, they really miss their bread or they miss their cheese. Or, and so we, we try. We'll try different things and see what happens with, um, with reintroduction. Um, and I don't think there is a hard and fast. Um, in my clinical experience, and these are you know, anecdotal experiences with my patients as opposed to a large trial, um, I can say that in general, many, not all, but many patients with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus can be sensitive to gluten, can be sensitive to cow's dairy. Many um, can tolerate um, sheep or goat's milk. And my patients who have psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease, unless they have celiac, which is a whole different autoimmune disease, many of them don't tolerate eggs and poultry, but they can eat all the bread they want without any major problems. Um, so um, going back to that idea of precision medicine, things are very individualized um, for any given patient, and we really need to keep that in mind when developing a plan of care. So um, these are just a couple of resources for, uh, for a Mediterranean or anti-inflammatory diet. And I do see there are some people in the audience who um, don't come from a Western background. And the ideas or the, the basis for a Mediterranean or anti-inflammatory diet can very easily be extrapolated into other cuisines, Mexican food, Indian food, Thai food. Um, so uh, the idea is, in general, if you look at the base of this anti-inflammatory food pyramid, the base is green leafy vegetables. Um, and next to that, other really colorful vegetables. Um, balanced proteins that are mostly um, plant-based or fish, and really limiting, limiting uh, red meat. And um, fruits, of course, we love all the different colors, um, particularly in patients who are diabetic or um, have cardiometabolic syndrome. We want to watch the amount of fruits they're taking in and be a little more veggie heavy. 
Um, and then there are what we call functional foods, specific things, spices, green tea, and other things that um, have phytonutrients that help fight inflammation. So specifically, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, everyone hears about omega-3s and fish oil, and how exactly is it or are they related to inflammation? Um, so uh, these fatty acids are essential fatty acids. We absolutely need them to survive. They make our cell membranes. And then when our body needs to metabolize them into something else, we snip a little bit out of the cell membrane. Um, the standard American diet has a ratio of omega, and let me just say, omega-3, 6, and 9 are all considered essential fatty acids. However, the standard American diet has a ratio of 6 to 3, um, omega-6 to omega-3, of about 20 to 1. That's the standard American diet. The hamburgers, french fries, not a lot of color on the plate. Um, uh, Eskimos have uh, an omega-3 to omega-6 ratio of 4 to 1. Ideally, I think a good anti-inflammatory Mediterranean diet aims for a ratio of 2 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. And basically, the omega-6 fatty acids, some of them are essential. Um, they, um, you, don't, you don't need to memorize this, don't worry. I'm not going to test you on it at the end of, end of our, our, our time here. But basically, the omega-3 fatty acids some of them, like uh, the ones that come from evening primrose oil and um, borage oil, um, actually can go down this metabolic pathway into an anti-inflammatory um, uh, chemical. But if you have an overabundance of omega-6 in your diet, soybean oil, corn oil, meat, lots of dairy, lots of, fit, uh, lots of eggs, it drives the... Uh, metabolism down to arachidonic acid, which is a pro-inflammatory chemical. Arachidonic acid is what aspirin and ibuprofen blocks the production of. Um, whereas your omega-3 fatty acids go down a different metabolic pathway and get metabolized into anti-inflammatory chemicals. So um, these diets that are omega-6 heavy really make patients more prone to developing chronic inflammation. So um, one of the other tips that I tell my patients um, is just eating a rainbow of fruits and veggies. And some people aren't, aren't used to that, so you will start slow. Um, but the different colored fruits and vegetables, they're colorful for a reason. They have phytonutrients. And I've listed a bunch of them here. I won't go into do too many detail. But most of these phytonutrients in these um, different fruits and vegetables have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory action, anti-carcinogenic action. So it doesn't surprise me when you have um, a study in rheumatoid arthritis showing that vegan and vegetarian diets lower inflammation, and you have a study that the cardiologists ran that show that vegan and vegetarian diets decrease risk of heart, di heart disease and stroke. Um, these are all different types of inflammation, some autoimmune, some just chronic inflammation, but diet plays a huge role in how much inflammation we have going on. And then my favorite is spices. I love spices. Um, I'm Indian. Uh, so uh, one of the thing about spices is that um, it's, it's, like a, it's a great deal. It, it's, a, it's an upgrade on your meal. You get added flavor and you get added health benefits with minimal calorie count. <laughs> so. Um, spices are fantastic, and you can throw things into smoothies. You can spice your tofu or your salmon. Um, they really add flavor. They make food enjoyable. Um, I'm a bit of a foodie as well, so when I have patients come to me and we're talking about cutting out this and cutting out that, and I'm seeing their face just dropping because they're foodies too, we start talking recipes, and the Internet now is such a fabulous resource for patients who are um, thinking about, if not doing an elimination diet, just overall improving their, their dietary intake and their nutrition. And there's fantastic recipes that you can find online. So um, the gist regarding diet and autoimmune inflammation. Overall, um, I didn't talk much about sugar. I mentioned it once, but it's a big no-no. Sugar definitely um, stimulates more inflammation in the body through various different mechanisms. Refined flours and meat, same thing. Um, I suggest cooking with more fla uh, spices, eating a rainbow of fruits and vegetables, really varying it. Um, kind of that has to go along with the season. 
Um, eating more fermented foods, which after we're done today, I've brought a little sample of, of, um, of this fun thing called a gut shot. Um, eating more prebiotic foods. So prebiotic foods, onion, garlic, uh, banana, chicory, drew some artichoke, prunes. These are all foods that our gut flora just loves. Um, adding in, if you're not vegetarian or vegan, adding in some cold water oily fish to your diet and um, drinking more green tea. Um, Justin Sonnenberg, in his journey towards, you know, I guess a better microbiome, he was testing his own stool um, to see what would happen with certain changes, started growing a lot of his own um, vegetables in his backyard with his children and with his wife um, and kind of followed. They got a dog. They did all kinds of things to tort sort of improve their gut flora. Um, go to farmer's market, join a CSA. So the purpose of this is, is multiple fold. One, gardening can be very relaxing. Two, it's probably better for the environment not having to, you know, truck tomatoes in from Mexico or wherever they come from. Um, and, uh, thirdly, if you're joining a CSA or some local organic farmers, you're supporting the local economy. Um, a, a note on organic foods. Um, there is currently not a ton of data specifically on pesticides and autoimmune inflammation. However, I would probably say they're, they're not good for us. Uh, we have all these bacteria that live in our gut, and many of these pesticides are used to kill bacteria and fungus and other things that grow on plants. So t when we ingest different pesticides, um, glyphosate, which is Roundup, and several other things, we're doing something to our microbiome. And, and we may also be doing other things to our own bodies, to our homo hormonal systems and other things with these, these ingested toxins. Um, but organic can get pricey. And so what I tell my patients is not everything absolutely has to be organic. And the Environmental Working Group has this fantastic website. You can put it on your phone. You can print up a little card-sized thing to carry in your wallet. And it has their, it might be more than 15 and 12 now, but it's their clean 15 and their dirty dozen of um, foods that really should be bought organic and others that are fine if you go conventional and just give them a good wash. Um, so it's, it's a resource that I frequently turn my patients to. And other, other ways to work around the expensive little basket of organic strawberries is frozen fruit um, and vegetables that you can get organic and they're not as expensive as buying them fresh. And particularly when they're out of season, it's an easy way to, to get them. Um, and uh, the last thing, again, I talked about on elim elimination diets and I encourage my patients to keep food journals to see are there specific foods that we haven't tried to eliminate that might be triggering more inflammation for them. And then the last thing which um, I haven't noted on yet is these AGEs, AGEs, Advanced Glycosylation End Products. They are chemicals that age us. They cause oxidative stress in the body. They can damage DNA. They happen when we cook food at high temperatures. So you've got that lovely salmon with all that omega-3 and you throw it on the grill and it's got nice little black marks on it, perfectly lined up, and uh, we're good. Um, but you're feeding yourself those end glycosylated uh, or advanced glycosylated uh, end products. So um, avoid cooking at high temperatures and um, doing things like boiling, steaming. It's a better way of cooking food that ends up keeping it healthier. Um, so. As a note, one size does not fit all. So these are sort of general ideas that I'm giving to you, but really uh, every patient has to kind of find what, what makes them tick in terms of food. But in general, I love this quote from Michael Pollan, and in case you haven't read any of his books, they're really um, fantastic books. But basically, eat food, not too much, and mostly plants. And I think that rule kind of goes for everybody. Um, so in terms of dietary supplements, and this is always a question I get from patients, is if I'm eating a fantastic diet and I've got every color of the rainbow, do I need a supplement? And I often say the answer is no, you don't. Um, but I'll be the first to say that I don't get as much turmeric in my diet as my grandmother did. Um, we eat Indian food maybe three times a week. So I take a curcumin supplement. Um, in terms of omega-3 fatty acids, I'm vegetarian. I don't eat fish. I get a lovely algae oil um, uh, DHA supplement that I take. 
Um, and, and a note about um, omega-3s. For anybody who is vegetarian or vegan and who doesn't eat fish, um, there are plant sources of omega-3 fatty acids, but it's not DHA and EPA. Those are only, those only come from animal sources. Um, the plant source of omega-3 is ALA. It's a shorter chain fatty acid. And uh, our body really needs to utilize the DHA form. And as humans, there are other animals and bacteria and other that, that um, convert ALA into DHA very efficiently. But as humans, we only convert about 6 to 8% of our ALA into DHA. So um, particularly in patients who have autoimmune inflammation, and if they are vegetarian or vegan, I certainly recommend that they um, take an, an algae-based um, DHA supplement. But there's a, a, a lovely caveat, and I think the ancient Ayurvedic doctors knew this, is that when you take turmeric, um, it actually increases that conversion rate of 6 to 8% of ALA to DHA up to like 20%. So there are ways to improve our um, DHA intake, even if, if we're vegetarian or vegan. Um, there are several other herbs and spices that I mentioned on here. Some of them come from Ayurvedic medicine. Vitamin D, I can't stress enough how important vitamin D is. Um, we tell patients not to spend too much time outdoors because of skin cancer and so forth. Um, and if you are outdoors, cover up with tons of sunscreen, but it should be a mineral-based one, not a chemical one. And... Um, and particularly for some of our patients who have certain families of autoimmune disease, lupus and dermatomyositis, um, it is actually contraindicated for them to be out sunbathing or even not sunbathing, walking from their car to the grocery store. Even a little bit of UV exposure can trigger flares of their disease. So um, vitamin D supplementation for some patients is, is essential, um, but it should be done in a monitored setting. So we're checking. You can very easily get toxic on vitamin D if you're taking too much. Um, I mentioned on a previous slide, uh, some different things that are used to support the intestinal flora. And again, uh, I don't think everybody needs to be on supplements. I think first and foremost, food is medicine. Uh, but some people might, if, particularly if they have an underlying condition, need a little extra support. Um, a, a little caveat about supplements is that Many supplements can have a blood thinning effect, particularly fish oil and curcumin. So if you are taking those and you're about to undergo some type of surgery or intervention, they should be held the same way you would hold an aspirin prior to the surgery. And there can also be a lot of drug supplement interactions. Um, so particularly in patients who are on immunosuppressant medications, there can be, you know, there can be some, some negative um, interactions between supplements. So certainly before starting anything, I always recommend to patients to check with their, their practitioner, their healthcare pr provider. So um, uh, we'll just skip over that. So the next step, so that was the main thing in body is, is really this gut, this idea of gut health and nutrition. There are a lot of other aspects to this idea of body balance. Um, and I think sleep is one of those that bridges or straddles body and mind. Certainly our bodies need rest, um, but it also is a rest time for our, our mind. And um, for patients who have chronic pain, whether it's from degenerative joint disease, back pain from you know, lumbar stenosis, or autoimmune inflammation, um, it's this vicious cycle of pain making it hard to get comfortable and waking them up in the middle of the night, and they're having this disturbed, interrupted sleep. And then during the day, um, the lack of sleep increases their sensitivity to pain. So their, their pain threshold drops. Um, a lot of patients uh, who have autoimmune diseases can also have other com com comorbid conditions that can affect their sleep, depression, anxiety, restless leg syndrome, um, which is often associated with an iron deficiency. So there sometimes can be medical causes for some of these sleep issues. Um, and uh, they can have daytime fatigue and somnolence. They can have poor work productivity. And uh, besides this pain issue and fatigue, there is clearly evidence that shows that lack of sleep contributes to um, uh, a, health, uh, a lot of other health problems. So it increases risk of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, um, mental health issues, heart disease, stroke, and overall shortens our lifespans. We actually, for, you know, I'm, I'm not going to quote it because I'll tell you the wrong numbers, but... Uh, there was a study that had averaged um, a certain number of years taken off your life if you didn't average a certain number of, of hours of sleep. So show of hands, who gets 
on average, eight hours of sleep every night. Pat yourself on the back. That is awesome. Okay. In this, like, crazy world, most of the people that I talk to do not get eight hours. Many of them barely get seven. Quite a few of them are running on empty with five to six hours of sleep every night, and some even less than that. And if you tag into that sleep duration, their sleep quality, um, it's not a good mix. So specifically sleep and rheumatologic disorders, there has been um, research done in this area. There is a, a researcher down at UCLA who has a very special interest in this. This particular study was done um, with some of our own colleagues here at Stanford through the sleep clinic and the pulmonary care clinic, as well as um, some collaborators at, at PAMF. Um, and they found that patients who had arthritis overall slept a shorter amount of time, had more sleep cor comorbidities like, like restless leg syndrome, and that their inflammation itself was actually worse. Patients who had uh, partial sleep deprivation had higher levels of tumor necrosis factor and IL-6 the morning after their, their partial sleep than you know, a day that they were allowed to sleep fully. <coughs> so we know that even at a cellular level, at, a, at a, the immune level, that the sleep deprivation can have a very big effect on the rheumatologic disorders. And, you know, my patients will tell me all the time, you know, I haven't been sleeping well, my joints hurt more. Uh, it's, it's a very obvious connection. So um, often in my clinic, uh, we talk about sleep, and we talk about what the issue is. Is it trouble falling asleep? Is it trouble staying asleep? And I always love pulling out the Ayurvedic clock to share with my patients. Um, and this was something that I, I mean, coming, I, I don't have special training in Ayurveda. It's my next thing that I'm going to do. Um, but uh, even having grown up in a household where all the home remedies were based in Ayurveda, I actually had not been exposed to this until recently when I, I met with an Ayurvedic practitioner. And the idea is that we all have, in, in Ayurveda, similar to traditional Chinese medicine, we have something called doshas. Those are our predispositions. And doshas um, not just describe a person's body type, um, but also their... their um, mental texture, their emotional texture, and, and no one person is all of one dosha. You can be a, a, a mix of all three or more predominantly one. My dad is almost all pitta, I'll tell you that. Super type A, super thin. Um, I might be a little bit vata and pitta, not too much kapha. And so each of these doshas has certain um, characteristics that go along with it. But even for any individual person, certain doshas predominate throughout the year at different seasons, and throughout the 24-hour day, certain doshas predominate. So for those patients who say, oh, you know, I have trouble falling asleep, many of them are going to bed at 11, 30, 12 o'clock. Well, 10 p.m., where are we? This is a 24-hour clock here. 10 p.m. is when the kapha, the quiet, subdued self is, is out. And then all of a sudden, around 10 p.m., approximately, is when pitta, the high metabolism self um, ev yeah, evolves. And during the day, that's great. That's our most productive time. That's when we should have our biggest meal. But if you go past 10 o'clock and you leave the kapha dosha and you enter the pitta dosha and you weren't already asleep, and during that pitta time at night, your cells are working. They're regenerating. They're, they're doing all the work they need to do that they can't do during the day when your body's moving and your mind is working. But if you go past that stage, well, all of a sudden, your mind's back awake again, your body's back awake again, you get your second wind. Has anybody experienced that second wind? Um, but then your cellular regeneration that's supposed to happen during that time is not happening. 3,000 years ago. This is amazing. Um, it makes so much sense. So uh, it's, it's one of those things. I love Google images. Um, so I, I pull up that Ayurvedic clock, and, and I would uh, you know, encourage you to go home and, and read up a little bit more about it. So tips for getting good sleep. Um, set a regular time for bedtime. You know, going to bed at 9.30 one day and 11.30 the next and 2 o'clock in the morning the next day, it, it's going to mess with your pineal gland. That's supposed to be secreting melatonin that it tells your body it's time to go to bed. So set a regular bedtime hour. Um, have a bedtime routine, whether it's a warm bath, journaling, reading a book. Um, deep breathing, guided imagery, essential oils. I love lavender. Um, avoid eating three hours before bedtime. Um, again, our metabolism, our gut working is sort of counter to 
sleeping and our body resting. Avoid screen time. We love our cell phones and our laptops and our, our iPads and everything else, but this lovely blue light that comes off of these screens tells our brain that it's daytime and our little pineal gland doesn't secrete melatonin. So turn it all off. I had just saw a patient uh, yesterday who said, oh, but I love my crossword puzzles. I said they sell them for three bucks at the grocery store. Get yourself a paper version. Um, so, so the screen time is a huge thing. People don't realize that that's keeping you up. Um, and then um, making sure you're comfortable. I love extra pillows. Um, having a good neck and spine alignment when you're sleeping. Um, making sure the clock's not ticking. That's one of those things that drives my husband crazy. We'll be at a hotel and he'll find the clock and take the battery out so it doesn't tick. So, um, and then if, if a patient needs to, then we will um, use supplements to help them sleep better until they kind of get into a routine. So melatonin is one of my favorites, particularly with seniors. Um, natural production of melatonin goes down with, with age. Um, and so many seniors have difficulty falling asleep, um, except during the day, it'll be two o'clock and you see them there in their chair. Um, but because that's because they didn't get a good night's sleep the night before. So a lot of seniors do need a little bit of melatonin support to help keep them their sleep regulated. Valerian hops, lemon balm, 5-HTP, um, a caveat to that is if you're on any kind of antidepressant, um, I do not recommend patients take 5-HTP. Um, passionflower, chamomile, teas, tinctures, they come in all different forms. Most of them are safe to use, but again, I always recommend to patients before you do anything, talk to your practitioner to make sure there's no interactions. Um, so moving on to, uh, to stress. So um, back in the day, there's that saber-toothed tiger. And if you had a good, strong stress response that told you to run or that, um, you know, told you to, to break really hard when, when a deer ran in front of your car, that's great. That's survival of the fittest. So a good, strong stress response through evolution has, has come down. And nowadays, we don't have the saber-toothed um, tiger chasing us. We sometimes have a deer, you know, running in front of the car. Um, but it's this chronic stress that is there all the time. So we are, we have evolved to have a very strong stress response, but it's supposed to be acute short-term stress. And instead, we have this strong stress response to what has turned into chronic long-term stress. Um, stress on the body um, modulates inflammation in a lot of ways. It has a lot of other thi uh, things too. So. Uh, short-term acute stress can actually be beneficial. Um, there were researchers out of UC Berkeley that found that short-term acute stress actually improved certain types of brain function, specifically areas of the hippocampus, which is uh, responsible for our memories. It would be good to remember which cave had the, you know, the angry lion in it so you didn't go back there again, right? So we've evolved that way. So acute stress, good for the hippocampus, good for memory. Chronic stress, not so much. We secrete more um, corticosteroid, we, um, more cortisol. That actually causes um, downregulation of certain genes in the hippocampus, makes our memories worse. If any patients have ever been on prednisone and they tell you, you know, I just, I, I'm not thinking as clearly anymore, I have brain fog, there's a reason for that. Um, so chronic stress, like many of us have been under for the last, you know, 11 months or so, and we might still have another three years and two months and ten-ish days more of this chronic stress. I'm hoping that my hippocampus is affected by that so I don't remember these four years. But anyways, I digress. Um, so uh, anyways, several pro-inflammatory cytokines can be upregulated in chronic stress. And so there, there is a lot of different effects. You have, of course, mental effects. Um, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, and so forth, and this is modulated through various different neurotransmitters. You have circadian rhythm disruption, so we talked about sleep already, and stress has such a huge impact on sleep. Um, we talked about, um, uh, well, we haven't talked about glycemic dysregulation, diabetes and obesity. Um, two things that you would think sleep had nothing to do with, oh, I should stay up the extra hour so I can work out and exercise. It's not going to work. You need the extra hour of sleep. So um, there are a lot of different things that, that stress modulates. Um, and so going back to stress, meditation is probably one of the things that has been studied 
most extensively um, when it comes to stress. And with meditation, we've seen that people who are intense meditators, like this lovely Buddhist monk here, um, that we see changes in brain activity. We see changes in the frontal lobe, in the hypothalamus, like I'd mentioned already, the hippocampus, the memory areas. Um, you see changes in neurotransmitter levels, serotonin and dopamine. Um, in melatonin, so sleep improves with, uh, with meditation. And you actually see structural changes in the brain. So these Buddhist monks who are really deep meditators and do it very frequently, they have thicker um, volume of their, their cortex. Um, and then moving on to sympathetic and parasympathetic. So sympathetic is that flight or fight response with the saber-toothed tiger, and it causes your heart rate to go up, your blood pressure to go up. And the parasympathetic response is our relaxation response. Heart rate down, breathing down, we are relaxed. Um, and so meditation has been found to increase our parasympathetic activity, which has um, impacts on a lot of our organ systems. And in a lot of these studies, there's various different ways to measure parasympathetic activity. One of the ways is looking at heart rate variability. And now there are a lot of these fancy little gadgets um, that you can wear that will tell you your heart rate variability. And if you're stressed out, you can check, oh, my sympathetic system is going strong here. Let me breathe. And then you can monitor your heart rate variability. So um, for many years, Doctors and rheumatologists did recognize that, yeah, stress was making their patients RA worse. They were coming in more inflamed after they lost a spouse or they lost a job or, or you know, with the big mortgage issues and the house thing, they lost a house. Whatever the stress was, they found that their disease was flaring. And it wasn't until more recently that we understood one of them, and there are probably multiple mechanisms, but one mechanism by which this is happening, and that is vagal, uh, vagus nerve control of the immune system. So you've got your brain, you've got the vagus nerve that's coming down, it kind of follows this track, um, cranial nerve 10, follows it down, goes through the diaphragm, and it innervates the spleen. And at the level of the spleen, the vagus nerve releases norepinephrine, um, a neurotransmitter, and it activates these suppressor T cells, T cells that tell the immune system, calm down. So when the T cell gets turned on by this vagus nerve um, norepinephrine, it then secretes acetylcholine, and that's a turn-off uh, signal to these macrophages. And macrophages are required. They're kind of at the top of the chain for inflammation. They present antigens to the rest of our lymphocytes. Um, and so if you get your macrophages to calm down, you can sort of calm down the rest of the inflammatory cascade. So we now have a very clear understanding, at least, of how the vagus nerve works. So how do we increase our vagal tone? We know it's good for a lot of things. Um, I'm just talking about inflammation, but we know risk of heart disease and stroke and diabetes and all kinds of other things go down when your parasympathetic nervous system is more active and your sympathetic is more calm. So meditation, we mentioned already. Reflexology. Who loves a good foot massage? Yeah, I do. Um, so reflexology, we have different nerve endings that go through our body and certain uh, pressure points in the foot can trigger the vagus response. Um, singing and chanting, the, the voice box is right next to the vagus nerve. So um, that reverberation in the back of my throat is stimulating my vagus nerve and calming me down. Um, singing in a choir, in a group setting, hymns at churches. Um, there's a reason why a lot of these practices through different cultures have come forward. Um, uh, group singing and chanting as a part of worship. There was, a, there was a reason. People had better health and felt better and were happier when they did that. Uh, breathing techniques. So um, deep diaphragmatic breathing. I told you this vagus nerve, it, it passes down through the diaphragm. We normally, when we're just sitting here, we're breathing in the top half of our lungs. But if you take a nice, deep, slow breath, and you push your diaphragm down, and then you let it all out, and it comes right back up, well, it's stimulating that vagus nerve. Um, so again, upregulating parasympathetic activity. Um, there are other breathing techniques that are part of um, ancient yoga practices. We call that pranayam. 
Um, one of them is alternate nostril breathing. I'm going to teach this to you all. It takes two seconds. So do like a hang loose sign, like you're in Hawaii, but you're going to pop up your ring finger. Okay. You're going to close one nostril, and you're going to breathe in and breathe out. Close, breathe in, breathe out. Simple process. You don't need anything but your hand. And th we have parasympathetic nerve um, endings in the top of our nasal bridge here that get stimulated when we do that slow alternate nostril breathing. Several thousand years ago that was discovered. I love it. So laughter. Who's heard about laughter clubs? Anyone? So there, this was a trend. I believe it started in India. Um, and uh, it, it's a club. You show up at a park. Other people show up. You decide what time you're going to go. And there's typically a leader. And he'll start out. Ha, ha, ha. And then everybody laughs. Ha, ha, ha. And then they try different forms of laughter. And it's first forced. But eventually, people are just cracking up. They're just laughing. It's, it's exhilarating, and it's good for vagus nerve stimulation. Um, we talked about gut health. I'm not going to go into too much more detail about that. Um, intermittent fasting. I can't claim to understand the whole physiology of this yet, but intermittent fasting also stimulates um, vagal tone, increases vagal tone. So this idea of not eating right before bedtime um, trying to have dinner around 6 p.m. and not having breakfast until after 8, where you get a good 12 to 14 hours of full, complete fasting, um, has a lot of positive health effects. Um, how much of that is through vagal tone and how much is it through other mechanisms, I, I couldn't tell you. Yoga, tai chi, exercise, um, and then, of course, my favorite, the implantable vagus nerve stimulator. How much easier can I get than that? Um, so... I do believe there is an FDA um, implantable vagus nerve stimulator that has been approved for depression. Um, there are several companies out there that are currently um, making these implantable devices that are under testing for specifically rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and it hasn't gotten FDA approval yet, but it's a really interesting drug-free potential intervention that can help um, inflammation. So this kind of takes me on to this, this junction. So sleep was the junction between body and mind. And, um, and this, this area of this, uh, this science of psycho, uh, immuno, neuroimmunology is this, this uh, junction between mind and spirit. Um, and this is sort of the, the science that um, thoughts can change uh, gene expression, which can change structure, which can change function, which can change phenotypic expression in a particular patient, animal, whatever you're looking at. So, that, so basically, thoughts are driving physiologic change, psychoneuroimmunology. Um, and specifically, in this case, uh, changes physiologic changes in the immune system. So uh, the science behind placebo effect, which we know exists, um, it falls under this idea of psychoneuroimmunology. But I think there are a lot of other things in this. Prayer, guided imagery and hypnosis, um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And, um, and for what I do with my patients, I very often will suggest guided imagery, whether it's for sleeping better, whether it's for fibromyalgia, whether it's for osteoarthritis and pain control, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, whatever the case may be. Um, the more... Uh, organ senses that you use in your imagery. So you not only visualize a place, but you imagine what it smells like, and you engage your, your sense of smell, and you bite into that juicy strawberry, so you're engaging your, your taste, a sense of taste. As much as you're imagining and you're using multiple senses, the more physiologic effect that guided imagery will have. So this is the idea of neuroplasticity. And there is um, uh, some limited research done specifically in the areas of pain and inflammation for guided imagery. Um, there is a website I frequently um, send my patients to. Um, it's healthjourneys.com that has a huge array of guided imageries that you can download or order a CD um, for various different things. Smoking cessation. Um, there's, a, there's a great one on there that can help people quit smoking. Um, how are we on time? 
Okay, just a, a super quick anecdote, and this is my N of one patient. So my brother um, had a congenital kidney issue, and by the time he was um, a freshman in high school, he essentially had kidney failure, but he was doing okay, numbers were fine, so he didn't get his first kidney transplant until he was a, a senior in high school. It was my mom's kidney. It was not good. He had tons of uh, acute rejection, had to get massive doses of steroids. Um, this skinny, scrawny Indian kid who was probably less than 100 pounds before the transplant suddenly gained over 100 pounds. Um, he lost his hips with avascular necrosis due to the steroids. Eventually, things calmed down. His baseline kidney function wasn't fantastic, but it was, it was decent. Um, he didn't need to be on dialysis. That kidney lasted around 12 years, which for a kidney that started out kind of with a rocky start, that was pretty good. Fast forward, he's on dialysis. He's been waiting four and a half years. He's having anxiety. He's having panic attacks. He's having a lot of health issues. And um, finally, he starts eating better. He starts exercising. Mentally, he's in a better place. He gets the call. He gets a new kidney. And uh, I was just thinking, I mean, we can't have a repeat of the first time around. So I found this woman online who does custom guided imageries and had her make one for my brother that was very specific to his situation. She mentioned places that he liked to go to relax, my uncle's condo in St. Augustine, the park around the corner where he used to go for a walk. She mentioned his immune system loving and embracing this new kidney and not rejecting it. She mentioned his bladder getting bigger so he didn't have to pee every two seconds. Um, and lo and behold, he was on minimal steroids, completely off prednisone by six weeks. And knock on wood, it's been smooth sailing with four years out. So that's my anecdotal report of guided imagery in my, case, in, in my thought. I think it, it, it likely helped him and, and made that, that transition with that transplant much better. So um, actually, it's my last two slides. So, so this is sort of a, a, a quick introduction to how I practice rheumatology, which is how I think everybody should practice rheumatology, and not just rheumatology, any, any patient-doctor relationship. Um, uh, we really need to look at all of our options, and we, we need to really have this goal of optimizing health and not just treating a specific symptom. Um, so uh, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Yes? What is your opinion of farm-raised fish? Okay, the question was, what is my opinion of farm-raised fish? Um, I think like anything, we are what we eat, and um, it depends on what uh, environment this farm-raised fish is growing in, in terms of the nutritional aspect, what they're feeding, what's in the feed. If it's corn and soy-based feed that they're giving these farm-raised um, salmon or other fish, they are, are not going to have the same omega three content as the, the, the fresh wild salmon, you know, from Alaska. Um, and the other caveat of this, and again, it's this idea of you are what you eat. Um, I think food also embodies a spirit. Um, this is the idea of energy medicine, um, which is a little bit more of an esoteric science, but a science none the least. And uh, kind of going back to the, um, the example of my brother, uh, he, you know, it was, it was another family's loss, but he was blessed with this kidney that gave him a new life. And his personality changed after he got this transplant. And what I knew of, of the young girl who, was, who donated her kidney or, you know, who, who lost her life and then and he got her kidney, I feel like he embodied what people said of her personality. So in terms of food... Food that has been raised lovingly and, you know, I love these local farms and supporting CSAs and going to the farmer's market because cause I think food also embodies uh, its environment and, and it's not just, you know, what went into it. Um, it's, it's how it was grown. So I, I don't have a, a, a black and white answer for you, like absolutely don't ever eat farm-raised uh, farm, farm <coughs> fish. Uh, it's probably better than eating a hamburger. Um, so, and, and for some patients, um, uh, a lot of my patients g come from backgrounds where they're lucky if, if there's something on the table besides like a $1.20 hamburger from McDonald's. So, um, so I, I'm never hard and fast about recommendations. Thank you. Yes? 
Yeah, on your spice chart, I didn't see any saffron. Saffron. The question was on my spice chart. I, I had excluded saffron. I think it was because I was. Um, I had missed it. Saffron, actually, um, there is some limited data on saffron's ability to uh, somewhat suppress the appetite. Um, it's mixed data, I'll be honest with that. Uh, there, there are some positive studies and some negative studies that noted that saffron can help with weight loss. And there are also studies of saffron in terms of mental health and depression. Um, so uh, certainly, I recommend to patients uh, to use it in their cooking. Laughing Spice is called. It's called Laughing Spice. Yes. In which culture? I'm a cook. You're a cook? Yes. OK. Well, in Europe, in uh, Middle Eastern countries. In Middle Eastern countries. So, so that's. As much as northern part of India, Iran. OK. Also, you didn't mention anything about hot black tea or white tea. So tea. The, this. The second question was um, the different types of tea, white tea versus green tea versus black tea. Um, I do think all of them have benefits. Green tea in particular has um, um, EGCG. I think I got the letters right. Uh, and I'm not going to try to say the full compound. Uh, but it's the main compound um, in green tea that has a lot of the antioxidant, anti-carcinogenic effects. Uh, but black tea certainly has, um, it's, it's basically a fermented version of a green tea. It starts out as green tea, and then it, it's fermented, and it becomes black tea. And there certainly, certainly is, is data for black tea as well. Um, I, I'm, uh, there is some newer data supporting low doses of caffeine for cognitive function. Um, I tell patients, particularly if they're having sleep issues, to limit their caffeine intake to the morning hours so that they're not affecting their sleep. White tea? And white tea, I, I can't comment as much. I, I'm not sure, but I, I think, new, uh, yeah, I don't know any of the new data on white tea. So as a healthcare provider, what, like, initial evaluation? Is it an hour an appointment with you? Or, I mean, you went over a lot of things, and I'm just trying to think. And so in reality, how so in, in reality, when patients do the little survey, yeah. I get the lowest points for wait times. Because I do tend to run over in my clinic, and usually not too bad, and I try to, but I, I have uh, an hour for new consults, 30 minutes for follow-ups. And a lot of times we can't do it all in one clinic. Um, I think, you know, there are a lot of integrative medicine practitioners that have the ideal setup. They've got a nutritionist, they've got a health coach, they've got a psychologist, or, um, uh, you know, they've got this whole team of providers that are working with them that can really you know, address all aspects of care with patients. Um, and I'm sort of a, I mean, I'm in the division of rheumatology and I have fantastic colleagues, but from the standpoint of, of patient care and integrative rheumatology, I'm sort of a sole practitioner. Um, so I rely a lot on handouts and, um, and we do what we can with the time we're allotted. And, and a lot of times it's not squeezed into the first visit. Yeah, back there. Can um, autoimmune disease and arthritis be reversed and put into total remission following food, you know, good food diet and supplements. Okay, so the question was, can autoimmune diseases be completely put into remission and essentially cured um, with lifestyle changes? And um, I'm going to answer that <laughs> in a way that may not be satisfying is yes and no. It depends on the disease. It depends on the severity. Um, I, I do think Overall, autoimmunity is, uh, is the, this is the analogy I give to my patients all the time, is it's, it's the light in the room. So the light in the room is inflammation. And the light switch on the wall has been turned in the, in the on position, in the up. And with a lot of our interventions, we currently have a means of unscrewing the light bulb, whether it's through diet or medications or sleeping better and quitting smoking. But we currently do not have a means of hitting the wall switch back in the down position. And, and that term that we use on the medical side is tolerance. How is your immune system able to know and recognize yourself as yourself and leave you alone um, compared to recognizing bacteria and virus and other things that are not supposed to be there? And what happens in autoimmune disease is we lose tolerance. Our, our immune system starts recognizing parts of our own body as something foreign and causing inflammation in those parts. So um, certainly patient's symptoms can be put into remission with 
either all lifestyle and dietary changes depending on the severity of the disease or with the combination of that along with um, medications. Um, but that underlying predisposition to autoimmunity may always be there. So, um, and, and, and genetic pre, uh, predisposition for autoimmunity is only a small portion of what occurs when a patient develops an autoimmune disease. I would say, you know, not quoting scientific numbers, but, but just throwing out there like 20% genetic, but 80% is some type of environmental insult that triggers the disease to, to go on. But, but really, you know, I have had patients with mild rheumatoid and mild lupus in whom we've really strongly addressed their um, diet and their lifestyle, and either with no or minimal medications, they're doing great. And then I have other patients who have been so fantastic about being true to a diet, and they're sleeping better, and they quit smoking, and whatever else, and they just have a rip-roaring autoimmune disease that requires some heavy-duty medication. So we see both things. Yes? What's the applicability to osteoarthritis? Good question. So what's the applicability to osteoarthritis? So um, if, you, if you look at cartilage under a microscope or you, or you measure certain cytokine levels within synovial fluid, that's the joint fluid, like uh, for tumor necrosis factor or some of the interleukins, you'll actually see elevated levels in an osteoarthritic knee compared to um, like matrix metalloproteinases. There are a lot of other chemicals that we'll see in an, in an osteoarthritic joint that is not in a normal joint. Um, and so the difference between rheumatoid and osteo often is that the inflammation in an osteoarthritic joint, a lot of it is being triggered locally. Um, there is damage to the tissue that stimulates an inflammatory response there locally. Um, like, you know, if you cut your arm, well, your immune system cells are going to come in there to try to repair the damage. Um, whereas in rheumatoid arthritis, it's, it's kind of like at, at headquarters. It says, okay, it's sending the immune system cells out to cause inflammation in specific um, parts of the body. But a lot of, a lot of these lifestyle changes are definitely applicable to osteoarthritis. Um, uh, there, is, there is limited uh, data, but, but positive studies for turmeric, for curcumin, which is the active component of turmeric. There are studies looking at boswellia um, and inflammation and osteoarthritis. Um, I do feel overall, however, osteoarthritis is a chronic degenerative condition that has not been studied as extensively as rheumatoid arthritis, and there's not as many drug companies or others interested in developing great cures and treatments. So whereas we have a whole armamentarium of treatment choices and options for RA, we don't really have as much for osteoarthritis. Um, but, um, you know, we have some fantastic researchers. Bill Robinson in our division has a huge interest in osteoarthritis and is looking more at the pathophysiology so that if you catch it early, can you arrest it and keep it from progressing? From progressing. He's doing translational work in that area. Any other questions? Yes. Do you think that things such as cat's claw, um, is it psychosomatic or can it be, have a real effect? So the question was, um, supplements like cat's claw, um, is, it a, is it a psychosomatic um, sort of effect in terms of improving pain, or is it a real thing? So um, I would say, number one, does it really matter so much if you're feeling better? Uh, number two, specifically for cat's claw, it can have a little bit of an effect kind of like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So if used in high doses, similar to Advil, Motrin, and Aleve, it can cause GI ulcerations in some patients. So cat's claw needs to be used judiciously. Um, but uh, I do think cat's claw specifically does have some anti-inflammatory effect, however. Um, so it likely is effective apart from a placebo effect. But uh, to give you an example of placebo, um, uh, I can't remember if it was um, Paxil or Zoloft, one of these uh, antidepressant medications that was studied you know, 20-some years ago. It got FDA approval for de treatment of depression, but um, it was pretty much as effective as the placebo arm in those studies. So uh, another uh, placebo is, um, you know, back in the day, orthopedic surgeons used to go and do these cleanouts. You had osteoarthritis. Well, they went in and did some nip and tuck and clean things out. Uh, so um, I believe it was somewhere in Texas, um, maybe about 10 years ago or so, they did a study of uh, sham surgery. So 
And the patients went into this study. They had to sign on the dotted line. They had to give their consent. Yes, I'll sign up. So they knew they had a 50-50 chance of getting the real surgical clean out versus getting a sham surgery. The patients go to the OR. They get three little incisions on their knee. Um, some of the patients got the full arthroscopic clean out. The other ones only got the three incisions, and then they were sewn up. No difference in pain and mobility. Um, four weeks, three months, and six months, I think, were the, the time periods. I'm, don't quote me on that. Uh, I don't recall. But it was big enough where surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, stopped doing arthroscopic cleanouts. Now, if you had a meniscal tear or you had synovitis that needed to be cleaned out, that gets cleaned out. But like just the, you've got osteoarthritis, let's get in there and smooth things out. That is not being done anymore. So the power of placebo is very, uh, there's, a, there's a man who's, um, and I'm blanking on his name, he's written an entire book about the science behind placebo effect. Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned a website for guided imagery. Healthjourneys.com. Uh, she's a fantastic woman, Bella Ruth Napperstek. Um, she has a very soothing voice. Uh, there are also a lot of other guided imageries on there. My kids sometimes have trouble sleeping, so there's one called Sleep Fairy. It's fantastic. The things that you talk about, does that also apply to thyroid issues like Hashimoto's? The question was if anti-inflammatory, uh, these approaches apply to Hashimoto's. So um, autoimmune thyroid disease, it still is autoimmune. Um, there have been some small studies, they've yet to be validated and repeated, replicated, um, that showed that um, a gluten-free diet lowered the anti-thyroid peroxidase levels in Hashimoto's patients. Um, I certainly think, uh, I, th I, I think regardless of whether somebody has Hashimoto's, following an anti-inflammatory lifestyle has broad um, uh, health benefits. Whether or not following uh, these anti-inflammatory practices and an anti-inflammatory lifestyle reduces your risk of developing hypothyroidism years down the road if you currently have Hashimoto's. I don't know that the data for that. But um, I think this, these, these basic lifestyle things apply to everybody. Um, they really do, no matter what you have. If you want to live healthy and vital and strong and sleep well and be energetic and be productive, I think it applies to everybody. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay. I mean, specifically, if you look at all the medicine, they say take you off dairy, soy, and, and yeah, dairy, soy, and gluten. That's a huge diet change. Is that necessary? I d I, I don't know the data for Hashimoto's specifically. And, and I'll be honest, for a lot of our autoimmune diseases, we just don't have the data to say eliminate X, Y, and Z, and you know, disease you know, Z or what letter A will get better. Um, we have trial and error with patients. Now, if you have big joint swelling or you've got skin rashes um, or you have specific numbers, you know, CRP or SED rate that's elevated, it's pretty easy to monitor. If you have Hashimoto's, it's really hard to say, uh, you could follow thyroid peroxidase antibodies, certainly. Um, and, and like I said, there was that one study that showed that gluten-free diet did lower the thyroid peroxidase antibodies, but I don't, know, uh, I don't know if there's data for the other things. Yeah. Um, so I brought a little treat. Um, it's a probiotic and a prebiotic. So we've got prunes. If you're prone to healthy bowel movements, maybe you want to avoid the prunes. Um, and I would say, you know, stick with one unless you really need more. Um, and then the probiotic uh, is this lovely uh, drink. It's called a gut shot. Um, they sell it at Costco. It's a beet ginger, so you're getting all kinds of fun antioxidants um, and trace minerals. Uh, beets are super high in manganese and magnesium. Uh, they're high in um, an antioxidant, and I'm gonna blank on the name. It's on my PowerPoint. Um, the, that deep red color is, is great for people. There's ginger in this gut shot. It's tart and it's a little bit salty, um, but it's one shot has about 10 billion CFU of live culture. Um, so help yourselves. What, what's the recommended dosage of probiotics? There is no standard recommended dose. Uh, it hasn't been established. Um, what do you 
if, if I have, and, and I'll tell you, this is not based on any studies. Um, it's kind of what I've been doing anecdotally. If I've had patients who have had a ton of antibiotics um, for whatever reason, um, I'll start them off at a pretty hefty dose, 35 to 50 billion CFUs, just to try to replenish things, that, that seed part. Um, is there specific data on how much? If there is, I'm not aware of it. Um, I haven't uh, dug through the literature to know if there's specific numbers. For patients, just sort of on maintenance thing, I certainly recommend eating a lot of fermented foods. Uh, I didn't mention, I mean, I mentioned this gut shot, but sauerkraut, um, yogurt, kefir, and if you're dairy-free, then you can make coconut milk yogurt, and we do that at home all the time. It's delicious. Um, and then uh, uh, beet kvass, miso. There are a lot of different uh, sources for fermented foods uh, that provide, you know, naturally occurring probiotics. Uh, but if you want to take an extra support um, pill, then I usually say like 5 to 10 billion CFU. Again, not based on any specific studies. Yeah. Russian stimulation for vagus nerve is uh, something is out. Is there a device? The question was about the vagus nerve stimulator. There is an FDA-approved uh, vagus nerve implantable vagus. So it's a surgery. It's a surgery. It's an implantable device that's been approved for depression. Um, an implantable device is currently under study uh, for rheumatoid arthritis. And um, I do know there's a study at Stanford looking at a va an implanted vagus nerve stimulator for gastroparesis. Um, so there could be a lot of potential um, uh, indications or places where this might work. But there's so many ways that we can stimulate the vagus nerve without having surgery. Mm -hmm. So singing, laughing, meditating, all that. Yeah. So anyways, uh, the back table there, help yourselves. And I think uh, we're going to stick some of my business cards over there as well. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.